Hello, everyone. This is Eric Pennington with The Spirit of EQ, and welcome to The Spirit of EQ podcast. Today's episode is Emotional Intelligence and the Tech Founder. Life is a journey. Spirit of EQ helps shape and guide the road ahead for individuals, leaders, teams, and organizations striving to realize their full potential through emotional intelligence. Spirit of EQ is a coaching and consulting company that assists individuals and businesses to reach their full potential by developing emotional intelligence. In business, managers and leaders recognize the value of training to develop leadership skills. What they may not realize is that those skills are far more effective when they pay attention to not only performance, but also to people. Emotional intelligence is a crucial skill because people drive performance and emotions drive people. Joining me in the studio, as always, is Jeff East with The Spirit of EQ. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hi, Eric, and everyone out there. Today, we have a very special guest, Kevin Dwinell with Tyvara. And um, I'm going to introduce him and actually let him kind of tell you guys about his background and his bio. But I've known Kevin for some years. He's one of my favorite people, and he's been gracious enough to uh, come on and talk a bit about uh, emotional intelligence, how it's playing out with the tech founder, as well as some other things around product development um, and understanding the audience, if I've got that correct. So, Kevin, hello. Welcome. Eric, thank you so much. Jeff, really appreciate you guys uh, inviting me onto the show today. And I think, Eric, you, you wanted a little bit of background. so Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for that. And you know, I, I work with Tavara. We are a uh, we help businesses co-create digital products. So I've uh, worked in the entrepreneurial space for quite a while, helping startups, helping enterprise innovation teams create new products. And then my own career, I've, I've been around product most of my career, um, and some of it going back to uh, some of my more interesting products were uh, in the an in animation. So I worked for Hanna Barbera Studios way back when. So I got to oh my. build things for Scooby Doo and Fred Flintstone, and and now I'm out into the internet space and doing digital things for a wide range of clients. How cool! Thank you for that. <laughs> sure. So, uh, Kevin, I, I've got a kind of go in that direction about product um and 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 for the audience everyone this is not just for or about tech founders i mean the entrepreneurial space that kevin mentioned is true there's all kinds of founders they're not all in technology but i think the tech founder is a curious one for us today and uh kevin has a lot of uh, background there too so as it relates to product development um kevin um and i'm gonna go from my uh my failed experiments and ideas, right? Even back to those times, you know, when you were having coffee with a close friend and you began to talk about, well, man, what if there was this app that did this and did this? And then you start getting excited. You get that, you know, that elation and uh, anticipation going. And you really think you're the next, you know, fill in the blank, right? And I know that's not enough to develop a product, but could you talk a little bit about uh, what the role of emotional intelligence and our audience knows we define that as the management management of your thoughts and your emotions to make optimal decisions. So with that definition in mind, what role does emotional intelligence play in product development? Just maybe starting at a high level. Yeah, I appreciate that. So at a, at a high level, well, a couple of things. First, um, you're, you're right. This does extend beyond just product. So it's it's importance in product, you know, I'm a firm believer in, but a lot of the principles we discuss here are relevant to business. Uh, they translate to our personal lives. So there's a tremendous amount of overlap here. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that high level, what you just uh, stated is, is quite true. It's, it's, you know, how we choose to interact with our emotions that really uh, impact things. And you can only do that when you are at that higher level. We, so many um, actions are driven through fear. And that fear is triggered by um, the amygdala, the, you know, the lizard brain. Mm -hmm. And when we, tr when we flip into that, because something has panicked us, we're having an anxiety attack, we're, we're fearful of some outcome, um, that creates that fight or flight response. And we are no longer operating 
at that higher brain function where we can tap into that emotional intelligence. So, you know, the first thing is both, you know, the people we're interacting with and with ourselves, if we can keep ourselves out of that fear uh, moment, you know, or if we identify it and kind of step back from it, that's when we get a little bit of chance to interact with that, uh, that emotional intelligence. Yes, and and we've talked about that amygdala many times, mm-hmm. and and the importance of moving from that. Uh, I know Daniel Goldman calls it the emotional center, uh, so that you can get to the you know the executive function of your brain. Those emotions typically involved in. Uh, I mean, I know for me, every product that I've ever been involved in or created. I had to be careful, Kevin, because I thought this is my baby, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I think you and I have talked before. That can be rather dangerous, right? Yeah, I mean, that's you talk about that idea that that you fall in love with, and and that energy is important to push through all the adversity mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you're going to encounter trying to create that new thing. Uh, the the caution there is ultimately that thing you're creating needs to be used by someone and that someone needs to find a ton of value in it. And so it's, it's, it's in that dance. So like you described, you know, when you have that brainstorm and you're meeting with someone over coffee and you're so excited to, to share that, you know, they're, they want to provide that emotional support to you. So they're just, you know, they're going to lean in. They're going to go, Oh, Eric, that's the best idea. Yeah. That sounds great. You know, would absolutely love something like that. And, and they're very sincere. You know, they want to be encouraging. They want to support. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't always <laughs> translate into the actual success of that idea, turning that idea into a product and that product potentially into a business. Because yeah. it's in there, that's the different audience. That's the audience where, you know, what is the pain? What is the, the problem that they are trying to address? How does this thing that, you know, you envision, how does that make their world so much better that they're willing to change their current behavior and adopt this thing that you want to, you want to create. And that is a surprisingly difficult uh, choice for people. I mean, we talk, uh, yeah, I mentioned fear, that fear of change is huge. And so you'll hear 10 X uh, thrown out a lot in, in new product because mm-hmm. investors want a 10 X return, mm-hmm. but that customer needs also needs to see a 10 X, uh, improvement in in their you know in their experience before they change their behavior. So people actually do things to their own detriment to avoid change. You know, so that fear of the unknown, even though that the world should be better if they you know if they adopt your idea, um, that's still a struggle to get people to do that. And so this is part of that connection. You know, what are their motivators? What are you know what what is that pain? And then how do you address that fear to get them to adopt? your idea, you know, that idea, then, you know, that's what starts to turn it into a product, something that other people gravitate toward. Yeah, that's really powerful, Kevin. And I really, you brought up something pretty, pretty profound in that this idea that the consumer or the customer, whoever it may be, they need that 10 time, 10 X return, uh, to make a change. Um, and I think, everyone in our audience would recognize that at some level that is the story of most of our lives. Um, I know that right now there's an app or I think it's, it may be beyond an app, but something called clubhouse. And I've had people talk to me about it. Oh, this is the coolest thing. This is, you know, you can do this and you can do that. And I'm kind of quite frankly, like I really am not interested in another social media platform. (laughs) So, I'm definitely not at a place where I'm seeing a 10 time or 10 X as you called it, Kevin return for me to shift my behavior and start using it. Um, and I think, and, and I know I, I've been there where, you know, when I heard what you described, Kevin, it kind of bummed me out cause I hadn't thought all that. I was so excited when I was meeting with my friend Bill, but then now you're telling me I need to think about, uh, 10x return and you know, all that kind of stuff. What are some ways that, if just come into your mind, that 
you might say to that entrepreneur who may be starting to feel like, well, maybe it's not such a great idea? Because I don't think you're calling for everybody just to stop. You're just giving them some good, healthy insight, right? Correct. Correct. And again, identifying who that customer is for the idea is important. And it's also important, I think, to, to keep in mind all the customers that are involved along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you're doing something in a, within a corporation, you know, you're going to have internal customers that need, you know, that you need their support. If you're selling into a business, you know, there might be a manager that needs to buy into the idea before it ever reaches the person who's actually going to use it. So there's usually more than one customer and making sure you're looking at each of them and understanding each of their needs and then part of that is, you know, when we're when we're intimate with an idea, we we learn how to talk about it so that we understand it, and you know, we know what it is we want to build. Um, you know, how to you know convey to our developers what it is we we are, are shooting for. But we also may not be speaking the language of that customer, and so it's important for us to to kind of get out of our own heads. And this is part of that emotional intelligence. It's like connecting with that user, not just from what's the the problem we're trying to solve for them, but how do they describe it? Mm-hmm. How will they identify it when you have it? You know, so because we've got to use their words. That's the point of understanding. And so Clubhouse, you know, I, I agree. It's it's the it's the hot thing. You know, I want to check it out, but you know, I've gravitated away from uh, social media. I'm I'm highly <laughs> highly distractible. So um, I can lose, you know, hours and days if I, if I get sucked into something. Um, Yeah. And, and I, I value podcasts like this because I feel like it's, it's concentrated information by people who have thought about, you know, what they're going to say. And I wonder, you know, well, is clubhouse going to give me that quality of, of content, but at the same time, uh, you know, and and maybe, maybe not, you know, a little more free form. Right. But at the same time, it's at the same time, it's a dialogue, which podcasts don't afford me. So like right here, we have this exchange and, you know, for that type of purpose, Clubhouse could be, you know, an outstanding outlet to, you know, bounce your ideas off of people, get some of that feedback, get some mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, you know, there's, there's probably value in these things, whether or not we personally identify with it. And actually I'm going to go down that path just a little bit longer um, again, it's all about, you know, to me, the emotional intelligence EQ, um, is about connecting with that other person, that other thought, that other thing that you may not necessarily relate to. And I remember hearing, a, a, an art critic from the village voice, um, talking about you know, how he views art. And, you know, for me, like, um, video art always confused me. It kind of creeped me out. I always <laughs> felt like a horror movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and, you know, this art critic said, you know, but he, he would look at things and say, well, what would I like about it if I was the type of person who liked this? And that change in perspective, that ability to get out of my head and go, you know, it's not about what I like. What what here can be appreciated? And finding that point of connection. And I think that's that goes a long way for, you know, the, I mean, I guess Eric and Jeff, you guys have seen this as much as anyone, right? It, you know, you're, you, you've got to connect with that other person and this is where those things play out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a question for you, Kevin, you kind of go back a little bit. You, you mentioned quality. And so how would you define the difference between quality and quantity when you're talking about this information? Yeah. And, and for a new product, you, you do need both. And, if we stick to, stick to quality of uh, the information you're trying to gather about your idea, the the important part for that tech founder, that person who's trying to create this idea, again, you can be so motivated by that idea, you're just going to stomp over any objections you hear. And you really have to, li- you know, it's, it's the old standby, you, you have to listen, you know, first seek to uh understand before you're uh, being understood as that founder with that idea, it's the early conversations, the high quality conversations are about getting that feedback from the user. What is it that they think? How do they understand the situation? How do they act 
um, you know, what are they doing when they need to start using your product? Does it just slide in naturally or is it something that they have to go out of their way to, to use? And so letting, letting the people talk about how they experience things, um, drives up the quality. Otherwise you're in selling mode and you're not going to get the information. Um, then once you have that, you know, that quality from say quantitative, dis- or excuse me, qualitative discussions, you know, where you're having a conversation like this, trying to you know, get people's feelings, then you, then you actually have to back that up with the quantifiable data, the, the volumes, but hopefully by then you've, you've solidified, um, the type of questions you need to ask and the answers you're looking for. So I hope that that got to your to yeah. intent to your question, uh, Jeff. Now that, that, that makes a lot of sense. I hadn't thought of it that way. So basically you're going to talk to people you know have an interest in the product, that understand what it's for, uh, that would be able to use it, and then you go further afield to – to find people, you know, to get more information from maybe less interested people. Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, actually, still in your your target because the early on, it's so hard to move people that you really need to stay focused on a limited audience. But yeah, you know, Eric, like I know you and I talked about um, your glucose your glucose monitors, mm-hmm. and you know they serve a very important function, but you've also um, learned what you need to do. And, and on some level that's become an annoyance, you know, and, and so you as the customer for that type of product, you know, what, what is now beyond that? What should that type of product be doing differently? And these are the things that, that we want to get out of the, both those qualitative conversations. So, in that instance, I might you know, dive in with Eric to say, Eric, what is it about you know those reminders that are annoying? You know, what is it? You know, what would be better <laughs> for you? What would you know? And and through that, I can verify whether or not my solution for Eric is is good or not. And Kevin, uh, Jeff is laughing because obviously he's in the studio and he can see me. Uh, but <laughs> wow, you really hit something on the head, and uh, and it's a it's a story around uh, a failure of, uh, I guess, if I'm trying to remember, I think they're sensors, right? Yeah. And the failure was is that with a glu- continuous glucose monitor, you have to you do a quasi injection of the sensor into your your subcutaneous tissue, right? And I had a failure. It it went in, but I could not remove it from its injector, right? So it has a little apparatus that injects it and then it there's a it unlocks to release. It didn't unlock. I'll spare you how much pain it was for me to pull it off <laughs> no. as one <laughs> one uh, piece of equipment, but I did and I survived and I probably used a few words that I would not repeat here. <laughs> But what's interesting to me, because one of our competencies in emotional intelligence is about empathy. So I called their, you know, customer service center, quality control area, what have you, and explained what happened. And where they missed it with their product, right, is that I didn't get any empathy. I mean, I didn't get someone that said, oh, my gosh, Mr. Pennington, that I know that had to have hurt. I know that didn't feel good, and it probably frustrated you, and that's not the experience that we want for our clients, our patients, right? I didn't get that. What I got was more of a – it was like he was reading from a manual. Like this is what you say when someone calls in with this type of problem. Yep. And that to me – you know, you're talking about where would you start? How would you want to improve it? I would dare say I would recommend – Let's start with maybe some training, development of frontline people about the importance of empathy. Um, yep. Because more than likely, right, uh, they're, most of their – I mean I'm in the 10 percentile group of, of uh, type – I'm a type 1 diabetic. So there's only 10 percent of us of the population of diabetics. So not a ton of people are. So it's not like I expect them to – you know, have had it happen to them, but I do expect them, 
based on the knowledge that they have been trained in that, hey, this probably is going to be something that will be major for them, even though you may not be able to relate to it directly. So I'm so glad you brought that up, not because I want to relive that experience, but <laughs> you know where I'm going. Yeah, absolutely. And that that is such a, a powerful point that you just made. It's the idea. Yes, it's empathy and connected to that. People want to know they matter. And so they want to be validated. And so it's like you went through this experience and it was painful. And part of that empathetic connection is going is just pausing for a moment and go, wow, Eric. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. That must have really hurt. And, you know, recognizing that this resulted in real pain. Um, you know, so that is that is a huge, huge point. Validation is is so, so critical. And I'm going to come back. Of, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you, Kevin. I'm going to come yeah, back to another uh, facet of that conversation. And I'm going to pitch over to Jeff here. Um, <laughs> think about it from the perspective, if you are that organization, and I'm still using this particular manufacturer, okay? They, they address yeah. the issue. It's pretty much in the rearview mirror now. However, yeah. how many experiences of not being validated and not feeling any empathy before there's another manufacturer whose product is just as good and they have that empathy? And I have a yeah. choice of which would I prefer. I don't think I have to tell you or Jeff or our audience what that would be. Uh, so there's something consequential going on when we have these interactions with the user or the or the customer, Jeff. I'll kick well, to you. on two things, but the first, with what Eric was saying, uh, my wife and I um, are we use a, a certain insurance company for pretty much everything, and I know we can get that insurance cheaper somewhere else. But every time we have had an issue with something, they have shown empathy, just like he said, and then fixed it right away. And, you know, for me, that's well worth the extra cost. So, yeah. the, you know, there's that. But the, the question I had was, do you use this information? Maybe you, you have this great idea. Then you start asking people about it. Do you use that information to maybe change the direction a little bit, to refine it a little bit deeper because you're finding out this is exactly what they want instead of what I think they want? Yes, um, to an extent. Anytime you're doing something new, you're, you're basing it on the best information you have at this time. And most of us have collected our information over an extended period of time. And so at this, you know, at this exact moment that you're going to, you know, build this, this idea, turn it into a product, you know, customer expectations may have changed. Technology may have changed. Um, user, how they interact with the thing, you know, say it's a phone app, how they interact with their phone may have changed. And so everything we think needs to be tested. Um, but there's just going to, there's going to be a hierarchy, right? Cause there's a good chance a lot, a lot of your thoughts are going to be wrong. We just don't always know which ones. Okay. And so the conversations will help us direct things or help us realize, you know, this is where, things are the most shaky. It's like, um, and this is, you know, and these are the, these are the, the conversations that, that happen with founders and with their teams. It's, it's, you know, I believe this is what needs to happen. And, um, you're going to be wrong a lot and you're going to have to be able to back up and try and try something new. Um, these conversations, they're, they're directional and they will help you figure out, okay, this is a high priority I think this is my starting point. Let's try that. And you try that thing, and if it works, uh, you, you do more of it. And if it doesn't, you try something else. And so, for example, with, with uh, Eric's example there, for a company to, to take that kind of feedback and go, you know what, we're going to change the script for our, our phone people. Like That is a very easy thing to implement. And they can immediately start gauging whether that's having a positive impact or not. And so that's a small example of what you're looking for. It's like, what are the things that can have an important impact and I can execute on with the little, with the least amount of effort? Um, cause you know, when you're starting to build a new product, it can get very expensive quickly and you just want to make sure you're pushing forward 
based on the best information and you're spending money wisely. As soon as you start building something, it gets really expensive. So the conversations that you're having are cheap. So use those to really make help you make smarter decisions. There's that's a, lot, uh, a that's, lot of a ramble there, but hopefully. No, 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 you're good. You're good. Yes. I, that, that's a great uh, segue to uh, another area that I wanted to touch on. And before I go there, you know, Kevin, and for our audience, the this idea around uh, the model that we use for emotional intelligence, it, it, we use the acronym KCG, but it's ultimately know yourself, choose yourself, give yourself, right? And it kind of flows in that kind of order. And I think whether it's a founder or whether you're a parent or whether you, whatever it is that you do, the importance of starting out at that place to know yourself and to, to get an understanding of your wiring. And I, I use this a number of times this idea of have you watched your own game film so i'm going to the sports <laughs> analogy a bit here uh, there's a reason why athletic teams watch film of their opponent and i think that's a great exercise for ourselves uh, you could even maybe if you're wanting to use an actual specific tool you could do a swat analysis on yourself right and yep. <laughs> SWOT, right? The acronym for SWAT. Hate those. <laughs> but they're valuable, right? Because they do, especially when we're writing, it's like, there it is. And I think uh, for me, uh, and I look back to my early days of entrepreneurism when I thought I had the idea, um, I really didn't recognize what was driving my motivation to have the idea. And that motivation had a lot to do with my relationship with my father, the idea of outrunning him, of exceeding him from where he had been and what he had accomplished. Right. Now, this is not my deep dive into, okay, here's how a father and son relationship should go. But the point is, if that's driving me, if that's a part of who I am, I think it's vital that I get a handle on that because, Kevin, I might have this great idea if I'm motivated by what I just described and I come to you and you say, Eric, actually, you know, that's going to be very expensive to develop. And oftentimes the chances of it getting off the ground and I would probably interrupt you and say, Kevin, you just you, you just don't believe in me. And, and you know what? I, I know there are other people in your line of work that probably think this is the greatest thing. Is it because that's true? Or is it that driving force of my relationship with my father that's pushing me to that decision or moving me to that decision? Um, that's a long way around to talk about the stressors that founders encounter um, in their pursuits. And yeah. certainly I'd be remiss if I didn't start there with that know yourself piece. I think the best founder is the one that has a good amount of self-knowledge and understands what their game film is telling them and potentially partners and, and team members. But could you talk a little bit about what you have seen, whether it's personal, kind of like what I described, or whether it's just, you know, the stressors of getting funding or whatever may be, may be the issue? Well, there's definitely a, a, a lot in there. And like even what you touched on, Eric, is there can definitely be different drivers and different motivators. And I think to your point, all of them need to be looked at with at least some level of objectivity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's easy to take things that, well, there's a book that I, I really enjoyed. It's called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And it really dives into kind of where our minds go. And our minds are often go after that easy thing. You know, it's like, oh, it just seems this way, so that's got to be the way it is. Mm. And I think what you're what you're talking about is in order to know yourself, you know, it creates a little bit of space between the thing you're addressing and the decision you're making of how to how to react to it. And and that takes time and that takes practice. Like that's 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 literally what like, meditation is designed for. And that's why you, you see a lot of founders uh, adopting meditation as a practice because it's it's a good stress reducer. But it also realizes that, you know, you're by focusing on the breath and trying to 
set aside each thought as it, as it arises, you realize your brain's just throwing thoughts at you all the time. And not all of them are, you know, <laughs> are worthy of belief. So, you know, the, the, <laughs> yeah. the more you know and the more you realize, okay, that just popped into my head. Is it true or not? You know, you, that little bit of time helps you interact better. Um, and that's where like, the stressors for founders, I think, a lot of them, again, we all fall into fear. We're, you know, we're fear driven. Mm-hmm. And some of those early things are, you know, the, the stuff that you hear or feel early on, you think like, Oh, I'm the only one that's experiencing this, you know, the imposter syndrome, right? Most yeah, of us yeah. suffer from that. It's like, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm you know, faking it till I make it, but someone's going to bust me before I make it. <laughs> They're going to realize, <laughs> right. I, I, you know, I really don't know what I'm doing and this is all going to fall apart quickly. Um, but the more you step back from that, and if you talk to people about that idea, you realize, oh, this is a very common thing. And so the, the, I think part of what you can do to reduce those stressors, because they are always, they're going to be there, is you know, the better you can label them. You know, oh, that's, you know, that's my relationship with my father coming up again. Or, oh, that's just, you know, this idea that I'm got good enough, the imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. Let me set that aside for now. You know, labeling the emotions rather than just having this sick feeling in the pit of your stomach, um, that labeling gives you a lot of power. Um, and then founders themselves, especially once they get funding and now they have a team, but they have limited, you know, they truly have a limited bank account, right? Yep. Like, here's money to go build your product. Like, okay, I've hired these people now that are going to help me build it, but, you know, in 12 months, I'm out of cash, you know, and I'm not going to make any probably for nine months. You know, that's a lot of anxiety and stress because now people, you know, have quit their well-paying jobs to take a bet on your idea. And you can't, in that team environment, you can't always share as freely. (laughs) You can't turn to your, you know, your co-founder and go, I so appreciate you being here in three months. I'm not sure I can pay you. (laughs) <laughs> that's going you know, to rattle around in their head, you know, even if they're on board. You know, so there's some things to not only just labeling the thoughts, but finding the people that can relate that you can share with. And founders, there are a lot of founder groups where it's a safe environment, where CEOs can share openly and work through some of these, these stressors. So, again, it, it make, makes you realize, okay, I'm not the only one dealing with this. There is a way out. Yeah, so I think a lot of it just identifying, you know, and labeling those stressors, I think, can go a long way. Yeah, and I, I something you had mentioned there about um, the safety uh, to be able to talk about those things. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, uh, and I'm just going from my own experience, and that is the tendency toward isolation. Um And for me, it was kind of the idea that, you know, I've got to be the one to figure it out, fix the problem, find the solution. And I really wasn't interested. Uh, Thankfully, a lot of this information that I'm giving you, Kevin, as well as audience, is in my rearview mirror. So I'm maybe living walking proof or whatever of learning from that. But in many, many years ago, I thought it was everything was up to me. You talk a little bit about the dangers of that type of isolation or even another if, if it comes to your mind that is a one of the more frequent issues that i do see and again i think it's a it's a it's the fact that our our experience or our beliefs you know pushes us to this is this is the way it is and and when we're committed to our idea again we could stop listening we can stop paying attention you know, there's someone that used to work. I, I, I used to be locked into that kind of thinking. And and uh, the person I was working with would go, is it possible this other thing is true? I go, yeah, it's possible. <laughs> and then she'd say, okay, well, let's just leave that there. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're planting seeds with me, aren't you? <laughs> and so I think some of that is you know, there's conviction, but there's you know, you, you need to make you need to revisit your ideas based on new information. And I think the challenge for like that founder is you, some of it, you, your opinion is the most important. So 
someone at some point needs to make the final decision. And so as that founder, as that CEO, it does bubble up to you. And I think it's important to use, you know, leverage the information that other people are sharing with you, especially if you've got a team. You know, I know you and I have talked about the, the creating safe environments, because mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. when you're trying to figure stuff out, people are going to share ideas. They're taking risks because they don't know if their idea is well-baked or not. And you want to accept that information. You don't want to shoot it down. You don't want to tear it apart. You want to leverage it and, but that doesn't mean you're going to, you're going to use it. You know, it's like a, agreement or understand, understanding doesn't equal agreement. And so what I encourage is, you know, that CEO needs to make the decision, but that decision can absolutely be wrong. And so know what you're going to try next. You know, and that's where that your team information in validating people, letting them know they matter. When someone suggests something, you can say, okay, thank you for that. Uh, I don't think I'm going to use it now. Here's, you know, and you may say, here's why and why I don't think it's as strong a starting point as this other area. But if this thing doesn't work out, that's the perfect next thing to try. You know, again, it's letting just people know that what they're contributing matters. It's letting them know that you're open to their feedback. Um, but as a CEO, you do have to make the decision. And so the the hard part is there, you know, keeping that open communication letting your team know that they are valued, letting your customer know that their input is valued. I can't tell you how many times I, yeah, I, I see people go through these conversations with customers and they just say, well, they don't see it right. Or, you know, it was the wrong customer or it was <laughs> it's like, mm. those to me are warning flags. It's like someone's telling you something and it's not breaking through. <laughs> I would pause a minute and look at that a little more. Well, and you know, there's something that uh, you mentioned that I think is really, really powerful. And you know, Jeff and I on the podcast have talked a lot about the idea of curiosity uh, versus judgment. Um, and maybe a better way to say that is exhausting curiosity before you make the judgment. And I think sometimes we, well, I mean, I, you look at our culture, and, and we very much are a very judgmental culture, at least in my yeah. my opinion. Um, and I think one of the reasons is, and you kind of alluded to it uh, as an example of what happens when you've shut off avenues of, of information and data, right? And um, I'll give you a great example, at least in my head, um, and um, the term systematic racism. And that those two words have been tossed around a lot in the most current, what, 12 months or so. Um, And I have, at most levels, have thought of it in terms of, you know, yes, there is some systemic racism. However, we spend too much time focusing on that and not enough time on what are the solutions and how do I live my life in a way, a la meaning, I can't wait to live my life when there's a solution and fixes a problem. I have to live a good life despite all the problems. So I had found myself kind of tuning out whenever I hear somebody bringing up systematic racism and feeling in my core, oh, no, that's overused. It's not as big of a deal as you're making it out to be, right? And I could feel in my own core there that says, you know, well, Eric, I mean, it seems like every time you hear that, you dismiss it now. So... I'm listening, and this was like maybe 1.30 in the morning, and I'm catching a, a repeat of the Colin Cowherd show <laughs> of all places, right? I wake up, and I, and I can't get back to sleep, but it's on in the background, and he's talking with uh, oh, the analyst, the guy. He was former football player, uh, player uh, LeVar Arrington, and they were okay. talking about why it does it seem like they're not that many – African-American head coaches in the NFL. And Arrington brought up, used this analogy that I thought was brilliant. He said, well, you know, it kind of makes sense, right? Because we talk about the coaching tree, the Andy Reid coaching tree or the Bill Walsh coaching tree or the Bill Belichick coaching tree. And why is it that they chose those coaches in that tree? Well, probably because they knew them and probably because they were familiar with them. 
And that's kind of what they did. Like when you're building a team, if you're a new head coach somewhere, who do you call? You call the people you've worked with before. And it just dawned on me because he, he made this point that at the end of the day, if you're an outsider, it's probably going to be pretty difficult for you to break through because that head coach has got his own group. And it's kind of interesting that most of the time in that group, they look like him. They are from the same places that he came from. I mean, it's all that. And it dawned on me, what if I would have said, oh, no, I'm not going to listen to this. I just systematic racism stuff. But by doing that, it allowed me to get a different perspective that I didn't have before. And hear me out. I'm not sitting here today to say, ah, so now it's rampant. It's everywhere, every organization, every situation. But I am saying that's one that I think is an identifiable problem that can be backed up by probably some, and I haven't done it, right, but some quantifiable, some quantitative data, right, that shows this. But it's that power to say, you know what, I need to listen. I need to listen to what you have to say before I jump to a conclusion. And you know what? It doesn't rob anybody of the right to disagree. I mean, Kevin, uh, Jeff, uh, our producer, Brett, you could say, I've heard Arrington before. I disagree because what he leaves out is this, 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 and this. That's okay. We can have that civil conversation. But the main point, right, is are you shutting off good information data because you're unwilling to see it in a different way. There, there's an official name for that. It's called non-dualistic thinking. Mm, always count on Jeff for those nuggets, uh, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> you know, dualistic thinking is black and white, yes or no. Non-dualistic thinking is allowing the possibility. Yeah, yeah. And we're better for that. I really firmly believe that. I firmly believe that. Yeah, I I like the word that you use too, Eric, of curiosity, mm-hmm. because I think that kind of gives you permission to to open that up, and it's it's a trait that I I struggle with myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I really admired a friend of mine who, regardless of what was said, I mean, this could be the the worst idea, the most harebrained, you know, the most offensive, and he he look at the person gently and go, "That's interesting." You know, why, why do you think that? Or how did you come to that conclusion? And let them talk. And it was like, <laughs> like he, you know, so for me, I would jump to a conclusion or I'd immediately get my hackles up and go, no, you're wrong. And, you know, and he was just very gentle and, and really interested. It's like, it's interesting. Tell me about that. And like those few words you know, are so empowering, both for you, and again, making that other person feel validated, giving them a chance to be heard and considered, all of that is, is, is just is very powerful. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, not that long ago, 150 years or so, when, when trains were first becoming the thing and they were getting faster and somebody or people believed that if you went 60 miles an hour, that would suck all the air out of your lungs and you would die. But there were people curious enough to prove that wrong. If not, we'd be going 60 miles an hour across the country. So, yeah, the curiosity is so important. And with human beings, I think it is um, vitally so because as much as we have made the mistake, I believe, in our culture of making things very dualistic, The reality is, as human beings, we're very, very unique. We're creative. We're, it is very dynamic in nature. And to think that something like a human being could be put into a dualistic approach, to your point, Jeff, I think you, you, you make a, you're, you're taking a great risk. And, um, I think that's where a lot of, a lot of those misunderstandings come in. So, um, Kevin, I wanted to ask you around um, the stress piece for, for founders. Um, what are, would you say if a founder is out there now listening to the show and 
wants, well, well, what are some things I can do to help that? I know you mentioned meditation. Is there anything else that you might recommend that a founder go to for a resource to help? I do want to lean in on the meditation piece. The University of Wisconsin, MIT, it's very well researched. And like seven minutes a day will give you the benefit of practitioners that are doing it hours a day. So it is not a huge time commitment, um, but the returns are are incredible. Uh, I also mentioned um, these founders groups. You know, so you can find uh, CEO peers mm-hmm. that are kind of at your stage of business that you can sit around a table with and and or I guess now a Zoom call. Um, <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, but you can have that sharing moment. And there's a lot in terms of how that helps um, release those stresses. So those are, those are two immediate things. Um, if you're caught in a moment, I encourage people to, to belly breathe. You know, we, I know when I was growing up, it was always, you know, chest breathe, you know, breathe, you know, when you're sprinting, you know, breathing, you're making sure you're expanding your chest. It's actually a very shallow way to breathe and that'll increase anxiety. Um, so if you breathe like a baby, let your belly fill out, um, it draws oxygen deeper into your body that can have a, a very calming effect. So a lot of it is just, you know, again, the more we stress, the more we flip into that fight or flight mode, that lizard brain. And so the things that we can do that kind of step us out of that are, are helpful. Um, and again, a lot of them are just are very simple steps, but I would share <laughs> with your peers. I would take some time, you know, for yourself. And I think if you start there, that would be a, that would go a long way. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Sure. So when we think about, um, our audience, And I know an audience can be pretty broad. It could be a customer. It could be our team. um, It could be our family. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that understanding. And maybe that segues back into the idea of curiosity. Um, What do you think are some of the important points of understanding your audience? Yeah, that's a, a good way of framing it. Because that is what you want to show, right? You want to show understanding versus, I heard you, but I'm not listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, you know, so that's where, you know, some of the, the ideas, paraphrasing, making sure you understand, you know, that itself communicates that you are really trying to get it. Or, you know, you're just repeating back, you know, kind of what, what you're sensing, Again, back with your um, glucose monitor situation, if the person just said, wow, that must have hurt, and you can go, yeah, it really did, you know, that moment of understanding is is powerful. Let me throw in something else here, too, Mm -hmm. which is when stakes are high, and that's definitely in in product, this is also in our family situations, right? It feels like sometimes life or death that, no, this is a decision, you know, my wife and I are making for my child, and... I know I'm right, you know, mm-hmm, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, you can get into a heated moment um, where it goes beyond, a, you know, a civil conversation and you're in a fight mode, but you can also fight fair, right? You can, you know, your, your emotions may rise, but things that you don't want to do is belittle the person, um, show contempt for the person, you know, eye roll when they're talking to you. All of these are things are, extremely dismissive and from again the idea of trying to make people feel like they matter and validating what they are feeling that will unravel all of it and these i've literally seen these kind of things happen uh where founding teams are falling apart i'm like wow these people are just not they're not a good couple Mm. (laughs) they're not treating each other with respect yeah um you know, so again, you know, it's, uh, understanding does not equal agreement. So, Kevin, within but, that, you you mentioned you know these founding teams that are falling apart. It's not the quality or the health of the team an indicator, oftentimes, of whether or not a company survives. There are so many things, and it's hard to. Uh, we talk about the quality of the idea, but ideas. There's a million of them out there. You know, your idea probably isn't unique. So, 
you'll hear the phrase, it's, it's about execution. It's not about the idea. Uh, you know, but a bad idea can only go so far. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's that, it is that team dynamic. Um, because if that team isn't executing and working well together, they're just not going to do as much as they can or as much as needed. Yep. So there's definitely an interplay there and each situation is, is going to be unique. Yeah. Like I, unfortunately the startups that I've been in have never been those, those rocket ships. Yeah. You know, there may be a trending up, um, but then we'll immediately get smacked back down. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. You know, so you know, success, uh, covers up a lot of things. And, you know, if you're struggling, you know, work, working through those things, all of this uh, emotional intelligence plays in a, a, a much more important role than if things are, you know, going right, regardless of what you're doing. Yeah. And one thing I would throw out for the audience, and we'll put it in the show notes, is a link to an interactive emotions wheel uh, from uh, our preferred partner, Six Seconds. It is a tool that uh, will help you with your emotional literacy. Um, and I think that's key when you're trying to understand other people as well as yourself. Uh, Kevin, you alluded to it very early on in the show that, you know, this idea that, you know, what is the emotion telling me? Identify it, name it. Um, because the better we are at that, I think it's better, we're going to be better able when we're in that family conversation with a spouse potentially about a decision for a child to recognize that if you're feeling fear, okay, what is fear? What is it telling me? Mm -hmm. Versus just reacting to the emotion when it comes. And um, that's that's just a, a, an area that I wanted to make sure the audience would know. And we'll, we'll again, we'll make sure to put that in the show notes for you. There will be a link for you. Yeah, and that, that, that goes a long way when, you know, when you get that sinking feeling in your gut. And you can stop for a moment and go, okay, what just happened? Mm. <laughs> I felt a shift. Yep. What was that? And then you back it up and you go, oh, that's when, you know, somebody said this. Well, why did that create that reaction in me? And then you can have that conversation and go, let's drill down on this point. Because yeah. something there didn't feel right. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but let's work on that a little more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. That's, that's, uh, that's great. That's great. So um, I want to give you an opportunity, Kevin, to maybe talk a little bit about um, some things or a thing that you are really excited about and that you're working on, whether that's inside of Tyvara or outside of Tyvara. But here's that uh, wonderful opportunity. We want to we want to hear from you on that. Well, yeah. I, well, thank you for that. I, one, sure. I really appreciated the time being here today. This was this was awesome. This is fun. Um, Eric, I think we, you know, and, and Jeff, I think a, a happy hour is in order because I think there's some topics that, that we need to drill down deeper on. <laughs> uh, and, and you're probably <laughs> right, Kevin. And this is typically the part where we realize that there is going to be a part two in the future. So don't think, don't think that this is the end. This is just the, right. the constraints of time, but you go ahead. I, I want, we want to hear about some of the things you're excited about right now. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm fortunate to work for Tyvara where we do build a lot of new products and again that's all size of companies so it's a it's that founder who has that idea mm -hmm. um and wants to push forward or it's that corporate enterprise and we we touch a lot of industries um i get to practice this this emotional intelligence because i'm on that forefront as product strategy and commercialization it's really how do we how do we prove this idea um deserves to be a product or a business mm -hmm. and working through these early stage questions um, and, and I think you probably picked up, I'm a little bit of a fan, uh, for meditation mm -hmm. and yep. <laughs> I, uh, I actually, uh, teach, uh, intro to meditation. So I belong to Columbus KTC. So Columbus KTC.org, um, every Sunday morning at 10, there's an intro to meditation class. It's free. Um, we're currently doing those, uh, through zoom and hopefully as we, you know, hit uh, immunity here optimistically later this year. Um, KTC burned down five years ago down in Franklinton by an act of arson, and the building, the rebuild is almost done now. Mm -hmm. So we will actually be able to do those in person if you're in Columbus, um, hopefully later this year. But again, that's a weekly opportunity to get instruction, 
um, see how easy it is to to make it a daily practice and you know get some of your early questions out. Gotcha. And that's, gotcha. that's it. So. All right. Well, no, that's good. That's that's good stuff. And we do mean it. We we, we want to have you back again, Kevin, because, you, you know, you've said some things that uh, and and this is the beauty of having great guests like you, that it kind of spurs us on mm-hmm. to thinking about, OK, wow, that that's something we should touch on. So uh, we'll definitely have you back. And um, for the audience, we really appreciate you uh, tuning in today. And we look forward to the next episode with the Spirit of EQ podcast. Take care. Hi, everyone. This is Eric Pennington with The Spirit of EQ. I'm not introducing a new episode today. I'm here to tell you some things that might help you. Jeff, you're with me as always. So how do people get in touch with us? Well, the best way is just send us an email at info at spiritofeq.com. That's awesome. Jeff, I was also thinking about reviews, and I'm notoriously bad at asking for them, so... Reviews on all of the platforms, wherever you get your podcasts. Yes. You think that'd be good? I think that would be great because, one, that will help us learn how to make better ones. And it's always good for us. So we're, hear- we're not the perfect podcast host. We're close. Okay. All but, right. But, but not, still, not totally we want perfect. your feedback. We want your feedback. But it'll, it also might uh, let us know a new subject. Hey, we need to dig deeper into that. Yeah. So let us know what you think. Cool. We really appreciate that. As always, too, there is social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, and we also have a YouTube channel. Those also have mechanisms or or options for you to be able to leave a comment, a like, or those kind of things. Just want to make sure that you know how to get in touch with us. Right, Jeff? Right. We appreciate you all. Thank you.